Okay, hello, this is Senate Government Operations. It is Wednesday, February 10th. And um, today we're going to continue our discussion on elections issues. And um, what I have on the list is the, uh, we're talking about candidates, the candidates requirements. Uh, there is a suggestion that we limit the number of JPs um, that the party can nominate, then talking about the primary and then the general election and then the um, <coughs> mail out of uh, ballots. So is that where everybody else is on this day with yes. this? Good, thank you. All right, so, and we've had, I have to say we've had some um, spirited discussions up to this point and some differences of opinions and um, I, I'm happy that we've had them. Some of them have uh, ended up in agreement with everybody and some of them have not. And when we get further on, I'm going to, um, I wanna start on these issues now, but when we get further on and talking to Amron about what to um, draft up for us, I'm going to bring up a topic that we had talked about before, but I think that there might be some changes in um, the in our committee um, understanding of them and um, support or non-support for them. So I'm going to just bring them up later. But for right now, I'd like to get started. And the first thing we have on our list is the um, requirement that candidates have to run for office have got to have voted in all elections for which they were qualified. That was the suggestion that was given to us. And Will, would you um, share with us what we have right now as re uh, require residency requirements for candidates other than the, um, we know that in the constitution for House and Senate members, you have to have lived for two years in the state of Vermont and for the one year preceding the election in the district which you uh, hope to represent and for governor and lieutenant governor and I believe treasurer, you have to have lived in the state for four years preceding the election. That it, it says resided in, it doesn't say what resided means. So Will, can you share with us what we think resided means at this point? Sure, you asked me two different questions. First, you asked me if I'd know about any residency requirements other than those. And yeah. that answer, that answer is no. Those okay. are the only yeah. residency requirements I'm aware of. Okay. Um, aside from, I would note that candidates for local offices have to be registered voters in the yeah. municipality. Um, as far as residency, you asked what you all think is the residency requirement and I'm not sure. What I would say is um, that term is just used in the constitution mm -hmm. that they have to be a resident for that long. It's not defined any further in the constitution. And as far as I'm aware, there's no direct <laughs> further definition of that in statute that's directly tied to res the residency requirements in the constitution for people serving in those offices. I think that if this matter were to come before a court, it is more likely than not that the residency definition that a court would turn to would be the residency definition in Title 17 for purposes of voter registration, just because it's the most closely related as far as subject matter. There are other residency definitions, like we've said, scattered throughout the statutes. I would think they would turn to the one in Title 17 that I provided to you this morning, Senator White. Do you want to remind me what, uh, Jeff, what that, where that is? 17 VSA 2122. 2122. Yes, that, that's what I um, was asking you to share with us. Sure. So, so did everybody get that? No, I, I, I haven't looked at it, but isn't it too, I thought for uh, the legislature, it was for two years. You had to live in Vermont for two years and one yes. year in the district. You're I, I, that's what that's what I said. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah. But but what is what is it for statewide? And it's nothing for people who are running for Congress, right? There's no residency requirement. Is there? No. The Constitution, we don't control federal offices anyway. I, I so I realize, but it's just good for us while we're thinking about these to know what they all are. I have no idea what the federal one is. But for statewide, then, Will, can you just, it, is that, I'm just looking at 2121. No, it's in the Constitution. And, right. it, and it's um, page 15 of the little Constitution, number 15, section 15 says two years for House and Senate. One, the most recent year has to have been in the in the um, district with that right. you want to represent, and on and section twenty three says governor and lieutenant governor four years, and I'm not sure where it says treasurer. And the other statewide, there's none. It's just those. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I just couldn't remember if the four years required any specific time in any specific district and I don't think it does. Well, because you're living I mean, in the whole state we, is their district. Right, 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 right. 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 Yeah. So are there any questions about where we think we are right now? Committee, vacation, Senator Rahm? Um, Senator Polina's hand was up first. I, I have oh, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Anthony. That's Anthony, okay. raise just... your left hand when you raise your hand because your right hand is out of my picture. Thank okay. you. I just want to make sure you don't have to be of quiet and peaceable behavior to run for office. <laughs> you do. <laughs> right. You do. Well, you have to be of quiet and peaceable behavior to be um, See, um, uh, to be able to vote. Right. So I not to run for have... office. Yeah. Oh, so you so. think it, it goes to running for office as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So, so something to consider. <laughs> Senator Rahm. So it looks like we don't have someone from the Attorney General's office. Yes, the Attorney General's office is not going to weigh in because this is not an issue for them. They will not um, tell us whether it would be constitutional or unconstitutional to require voting. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't, and they would. They are reluctant to um, advise us on. Um, how a court would deal with it mm -hmm. because they, if we passed something, they would be put in the position of defending what we passed. Okay, got it. And if we don't, if we don't pass anything, they're not in a position because mm -hmm. they are defending nothing. It, the, a court case would be between the person who was being challenged and the person who was challenging. Okay, that was, so I was curious when they were going to come in because I was wondering if it's up to the individual parties to be privately represented in this kind of court case. Yes. Okay. And I was going to ask whichever lawyer, you know, was, was sort of present with us, what the pros and cons are of having that determined by a private court case. Um, you know, I would just name, name the ones that, that I see, which are, you know, someone may not have the means to be well represented in that kind of case. They might, may not be as popular of a candidate. Um, you know, I'm, I, I saw it, I've been thinking a lot about what it means for it to go to court. Um, has it gone to court before? Has, can anyone remember a time that it has gone to court? Not that I know of. I will, Chris, I don't think so. If they had gone to court, there probably would have been um, a resolution by the court and there would have been um, there, there's no court cases. Okay. Okay. So I, I have to say, I don't really want to prolong this conversation very much because we've, we've had it before for such a long time and the decision at that time. So, uh, so unless anybody has any other suggestions, the decision at that time was that short of, of defining what it meant, you had to live here you had to be physically present for 183 days. You had to have, um, you don't even have to be on the checklist to run for, uh, you don't have to be a voter, I don't think, to 
run for office. You do for local office, but um, you have to own property. Um, you have to have paid Vermont taxes. Uh, you have to have children in school. What, whatever we put in there um, would was problematic. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 at this point, I can't think of anything we could put in there that would not be problematic. So if anybody has any good suggestions, just throw them out. I mean, throw them out at us. <laughs> <laughs> share, in, in other words, share them. Yes, share them, share them. Well, so, you know, as I scan and I don't see anybody sort of wanting to throw another idea out, you know, uh, I'll just say as, as someone who I have learned today has been accused of causing World War III here with my suggestion, um, it was an attempt to not require someone to be property owning or, you know, have other things that are kind of a class marker that would demonstrate that they are a resident here. I've just dealt with a young person, you know, at UVM who came back from military service and had to fight with UVM about, you know, in-state tuition, et cetera. Um, so I was trying to find an alternative to kind of a property ownership model. Um, I see some issues with waiting for the courts to be the ones to hash this out and whether or not it came up after the last time the committee took extensive testimony on this. I know we're not taking up constitutional changes this year, but I would actually say if we don't further see a, an ability to define it, I, I would actually be more in favor of taking it out. I, I even said to, to you know, Dave Graham, I was the one who said, maybe it should just be naming the, you know, 10 of the Vermont towns and, and getting it right, um, you know, a la Fred Tuttle. But, you know, at this point, um, I just worry more about someone who's either an unpopular candidate or doesn't have the ability to well represent themselves being taken out of a race or even a popular candidate being taken out of a race because this challenge goes to court rather than us having a clear definition. Um, so at some point in the future, you know, I would actually recommend we, we don't have a residency requirement rather than waiting for the courts to determine what it is. Okay, well, that, that would be something for the next biennium because that's when you can introduce constitutional amendments. So does anybody else, Senator Clarkson? I'm trying to find where the land ownership thing is identified. I can't find that. I, I didn't, no, I didn't say there is land ownership. Okay, so there, Keisha, there is, you don't have no, to own no. Okay, Senator Clarkson, that was my fault. I said short of define, when we talked right, about right, it okay. before, that that, was a, short of defining it in some way, how do you do right. it? And yes, land ownership was one of the ways you could define being right, a resident. But thank goodness we don't. Yes, we don't. So I'm happy to leave it as it is. Um, and I uh, and I think it is an ongoing issue. We dealt with it, you know, two years ago, pretty fully. And I don't, if nobody has a better idea, I would keep it as it is. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the suggestion to limit the number of JPs that a party can um, nominate, and I suspect I, um, that that came from probably a town where, in Putney, for example, I will say that we used to, we have 12 JPs, and the parties used to, the Democrats would nominate six and the Republicans would nominate six. And um, that, that just kind of was a, an understanding. We can't get any Republicans to be nominated now. I don't know that we have a Republican um, caucus in town. So the 12 candidates tend to be either Democrats or progressives or combination. And, and so I suspect that this suggestion came from a similar town where you it's hard to get um, people nominated from the minority party or non-party. So do, Will, do you want to comment on this at all? And I'm not sure if this would even be constitutional. <laughs> sure, I have a few comments, Senator White, that I hope will help. <clears throat> I think you've probably identified one potential uh, reason that this issue would be raised. It also, I think, may have come from the fact that so everything you said is correct. There, each town has a set number of justices of the peace that they can elect. It's based on their population, I believe. Um, 
Mm -hmm. For a long time, there has been gentlemen's agreements, traditions in a lot of towns where each individual party committee in that town only nominates one half of that number. The numbers are odd. So every two year cycle, it will flip back and forth between the two parties where say you have five justices of the peace, the Democrats do three one year, the Republicans do two. Then the next cycle, the Republicans do three and the Democrats do two. <clears throat> Those, like I said, are gentlemen agreements that I'm aware of just anecdotally in my position and hearing from people with questions about these that have, I don't wanna say broken down, but gone away in a number of places. And so now I think there are some instances where there are people of one party or the other who were used to that gentleman's agreement and it has is now not being followed and the other party is say, nominating enough people for the whole slate. And so then the reaction is, can we limit the number of mm -hmm. candidates that party would nominate? Maybe you would say proactively every other year you nominate one half minus one. I don't think that's a good idea and not sure whether that's constitutional either. And I wanted to point out that it's interesting and we give this advice of course when asked, but I don't think we're always asked. There's a provision in the statute already Title 17, Section 2143, Political mm -hmm. Representation on the Board of Civil Authority. I won't read the whole thing because of time, but essentially it says if um, one or another party is underrepresented, the Board of Civil Authority of any public political yep. subdivision does not contain at least three of each major party, the legislative body can appoint additional justices of the peace from that underrepresented party at the request of either the party, town party committee, or even three voters in the town. And then it's interesting, it's a good provision. It says that those justices of the peace can only serve elections functions where yeah. that balance is needed. They can't then hear um, property tax appeals, for instance. So there is already a provision in there that, that would let the underrepresented party correct that balance for purposes of representation on elections business on the DCA. And otherwise, I think it's a matter of kind of people sorting out the fact that those were gentlemen's agreements that didn't have a basis in the law and nominate an equal slate to run against each other and may the best man win or woman or, or woman or person. <laughs> so um, I am I don't know that I've ever had opportunity to disagree with you before. But I am going to correct you on something. OK. They, the towns can um, elect up to, and it's five, seven, 10, and 12. Thank you. So it's not all um, odd numbers. Five, seven, 10, you're right. You've yeah. disagreed with me many times before though, and been right. But I've never corrected you. <laughs> huh. Does, Anybody else have anything that would like to weigh in on this? And I do think that provision was put in there. Um, I mean, I, I think there is that provision for having um, non-elected JPs to uh, balance it out. And also, um, if, if you don't have them even serving as BCA members, I think that when there's election issues, you have to try and make sure that you have a balance between the parties. And that's that's in Title 17. So anybody else care to weigh in on that one? Uh, Senator how, Clarkson? How big is the, this issue? How big is this problem? I, my guess is that there are people in a lot of towns where there isn't a balance that probably feel um, left out of the process. I, I have no idea how big it is. Um, I mean, maybe and, Gwen, or maybe Gwen or but, somebody could weigh in. I mean, who brought it? Did, did, was this brought by a large crowd? I mean, was this brought to us by VLCT or? No, no, it was, it was not. But, but regardless of how many towns are in that situation. I don't know that there's much we can do about it. I mean, if. Yeah, no, that's what. Got so it. when did you want to weigh in on it at all? This is the first I hear of this being an issue. This is not, and it's a statewide, I mean, this is not a municipal office. Yes, either, this so is a JP. I mean, yes. 
This is JP's. I mean, this oh, is you, you, but it's not a municipal office. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, it's not a, right. But it is it, by town. It's not right. serving municipal functions, is what I right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to weigh in on this one? No. Okay. No. Let's move to the primary then. So here's the issue that uh, John has brought up, Carol has brought up, and Will has brought up. Uh, the issue of the timing of local ballots with the primary, L local. And so uh, do you want to, who wants to weigh in on that to uh, set the stage for us? Is that a Will issue? It may be, although I think um, from our perspective, the more important thing was the general election, not the primary. Oh, okay. Is that the case, Carol and John? It's the general rather than the primary, Carol? Or am I forgetting? It, it, it's actually um, both, uh, mainly because of the, the difference between local election timelines for um, for warnings for having ballots available um, and trying to have an opportunity to uh, perhaps print local questions on um, on the again the, the general ballot in that case the general election ballot but more importantly being able to have the timelines change so that you can mail all your ballots at one time um, so that you're not you know because the for the primary in the general election, they go out 47 days before for local elections, it's 20 and you're doing two mailings. And so if there's a, a way to um, to adjust those uh, those dates for local elections, it would also be beneficial to have that that expanded window for all local elections. Um, not just for the ones that are held in conjunction with the primary and the general. John? Absolutely. Um, my concern um, is, because I'm in the middle of it, is the town meeting uh, deadlines uh, for town meeting day. So not, not simply to sync them with the, the, uh, the primary and the general. But um, you know we have no margin for error under such a short turnaround. Um, folks do expect their ballots earlier than we can actually provide them. But I've had some difficulties, and I've already used up the few days of margin for error I have. So it would be a, it would be a good thing to. I, eventually, that's going to cause problems. I, I think it has, in terms of misprinted ballots in a couple other towns in recent years. And if there were a little more breathing space there to, to get those filing deadlines and to deal with that, you'd, I think you'd see those problems largely, largely fade away. And I'm knocking on wood when I say that. I think there may, might be two, two separate coordinations here. One is this coordination of the local timing with the state elections. And the other is the coordination between town and school. And I think that the coordination between town and school might be a larger conversation because it has to involve clearly the agency of education. But can are are they two separate issues here, Will, or can they be dealt with in separately or together? Those are definitely two separate issues, and I think you are right that the coordination between school and town votes will take longer than a small issue would. Um, but there, I think I heard three issues there. If you're bringing in coordination with school districts, because what I heard from John and Carol is one, the issue of coordinating with statewide elections. If you wanna hold an election on that same date, get those voters and send your local election ballots out with your statewide election ballots, how we can facilitate that better. And then I, what I heard from John was a very general statement about simply moving the deadlines back related to local elections and creation of ballots and candidate filings. Am I right, John? I mean. Yes, I think, and I think it would be something that would need to be held in mind anyway, because you'd want consistency between you know special 
you know, essentially special town or city meetings, which would be not on town meeting day. And then the town meeting day ones, having two separate, you know, sets of filing deadlines and a different type of or length of calendar, I think could create issues. I think it would need to be uniform. So whatever you all decide for, I would say for, for August and uh, uh, November, you know, you should think in terms of consistency to, to applying it least to an extent as much as possible to a town meeting day. Carol? Just wanted to give an example. A couple of years ago, Barry City wanted to add a question to the November general uh, ballot in uh, 2018. Um, and uh, the deadline for getting the language to the Secretary of State's office is about 55 days or so before the election because the, the ballots have to be available 47 days before. Well, a, for a local election, uh, you can't approve your warning more than 40 days in advance. And so we were outside of that 30 to 40 day window to approve the warning for the special election. I managed to talk my city council into approving the language early enough that we could put it on the ballot, but then said to them, you can't change it when we go to approve the warning because we've already printed the ballots. So it's, it, you know, you're, you're running into those really gray areas if you do that kind of stuff. Got it. So is this something that, can, is, are the, these timing issues, it would be really nice to get them, at least the, some of them in place for the next election. Is that something that can happen uh, between the Secretary of State's office and the clerks within a short period of time? Senator Rahm, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Carol? I, I can see the, the clerks and, and the Secretary of State's office coming up with some language. I can also see some potential pushback from um, from select boards who want to have that extra time to develop the budgets they want to vote on, develop the questions they want to vote on. And so I can see there being um, pushback um, in, in, uh, in that direction um, for widening the window. Just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, I, I was just thinking back to my select board days and it's hard enough to get things done in the timeline that, I mean, yeah, to lengthen it would be problematic for a lot of towns, I would think. Gwen, do you have an opinion on that? Finding the mute button. Um, I, I think that's probably why a lot of this hasn't changed is because of finding the right numbers that okay. work for everybody. So yeah, I would definitely agree. Well, a committee, what do you what do you think? Oh, Will, I'm sorry. Just one final thought. I think I appreciate Carol bringing that up because that is a consideration. But that to me speaks more to, and I understand um, John Odom's desire to have some consistency across the local elections. But that really would become more of an issue if you were trying to do that. If you were trying to do it as a general matter for all local elections, including annual meeting. And I feel like it, it may have the biggest pushback around annual meeting. I don't, I'm speaking a little bit out of, off the top of my head, but where you have a lot to develop in January in a short time frame when you're back from holidays and are thinking about the new year. Um, but I think that you could potentially not, um, not invoke that entire discussion with some more specific language toward the primary and the general about special elections, where I would imagine that section starting something to the effect of, if a town or city desires to hold a special election as the November general or August primary, yada, yada, here are your deadlines to get oh. an article sent out for in that specific circumstance, but not for the rest of your local elections throughout the year. Oh. And I'd be willing to work on that kind of more targeted language with Carol if she agrees that that might be possible. Oh, okay. Anthony, Senator Polina. Well, just, just to be clear, you're saying it would be, it would be an option essentially. Yes, 
I mean, yeah. it's always an option whether they want to hold a special election in sure. with our statewide elections. Because I can I can envision a lot of pushback on that other question. Uh, otherwise, without having a whole lot of hearings and hearing from a lot of town clerks and select board members and whatnot, but I think making it an option might actually get people used to the idea, and they might end up maybe a couple of years down the road, it may end up making it uh, may make it more formal. But but this is you're talking about just if they wanted to have a question on the um, November or August ballot they wanted to hold a, a special election that that day so they could mail it out together but there is no um there is no um state election in march anyway so that that's less of an issue isn't it because they, they don't have to coordinate with the state on march elections yep. okay all right so can committee does anybody else have any questions or comments about that and should we just let them go and see if they can come up with something well can i just ask again you know yeah. you're talking you're using the word election special election but i presume it would relate to anything meaning a, a ballot question not, we're not we don't mean an election of a person okay. to an office you mean any question that they might bring forward yeah okay yeah. that's what i thought no, sorry i didn't mean that yeah yeah uh john you know, I realized realized I was tilting at windmills a bit there, but maybe if if uh, if Will and Carol, uh, if with the blessing of the council, might look at at least moving back the candidate filing deadline a bit. That shouldn't interfere with um, the you know the select boards and city councils and their uh, budget uh, you know creation process. But it would potentially allow us another week or so to. Uh, to deal with with the ballots. I mean, a one week would make a huge difference um, on those March elections. John, do you do you know that I assume when you said with the approval of you're uh, talking about us and you said the council? Oh, sorry, I'm used to that. I just, <laughs> That's I, I figured you council were. Is, and I've got a council meeting tonight. It's just all the committee. Yes, I know. Was. It's it's just fine. It's just fine. I knew what you meant and I'm sure everybody else did, too. I should have said all y'all. All y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from Kentucky, so there you go. Anybody have any concerns about um, seeing if we can come up with something that would allow towns to do that and the state to combine on those two um, elections? No. Okay, good. So let's see if we can come up with something. Okay, so the uh, next question on the list was, um, Alternatives to sending out three ballots um, in the primary. And one of the suggestions was letting people request a ballot. I'm not sure if that would, that would save on postage. It wouldn't probably save on printing, but any committee members have anything they'd like to throw into this conversation? And then we'll um, ask Will if he has some suggestions and the town clerks and the LCT and anybody else. I don't see any hands. All right, Will, do you want to talk a little bit about that issue? Sure, this is a, I think it's a large issue with a lot of implications. The suggestion would be, um, I guess one potential suggestion would be requiring voters to request when they request their absentee ballot for the primary to indicate which party's ballot they seems reasonable and like it would make total sense and it would be easy to implement and would save on postage. Um, my knowledge of the history of that is that people do not want that choice recorded and available for um, people to request public records on and have more information about what your party affiliation is. Um, further steps down that road would be actually registering by party in Vermont. That would be a fundamental change. And I see Madam Chair's immediate reaction to that is, is <laughs> like most Vermonters that I speak with. Um, so, so short of that, in order to avoid sending all three primary ballots uh, out to every voter, you would need to have them request which one they want 
election by election. Mm -hmm. And that choice is going to be a public record unless you all somehow exempt it from being. That's public. what I was going to ask. Would it have to be a public record? And that's a good question for somebody other than me. <laughs> Senator Clarkson. Nothing else about our ballots is, a uh, well. <clears throat> yes, it is. It, there is, yes, I was, I was gonna say, it. right. I right. think I've told There's you- There's one time when you, when it's marked, which you request, uh, they used to mark on the checklist, which ballot you take when you're in person voting, they would mark, mark which one you took. They, that was, I, I think that was probably illegal for them to do because they are supposed to hand you all three ballots. I know, they are but- not in it, person that, that was re that's relatively new i feel like because we used to be able to have the checklist copied in those days and you would see who requested what in the presidential right? am i in the crazy in, that? in the presidential no, pres presidential yeah. presidential oh, in, only. in the presidential right only. yes only so that is the only time your ballot choice is made public yes and any indication of your party preference is made public whatsoever. Yeah. So- And that, Senator White, I've given you guys the brief history on that before, that that was a push and pull where- Right. My understanding is the national parties were trying to strip Vermont of its primary. Mm -hmm. Right. So that we wouldn't have, have a part in the primary process, the pushback for what they wanted is they said, do party registration or we're stripping your primary because they yep. want that information on people's party preferences. The pushback was no, we're not going to do party registration. And the compromise was that every four years at the presidential primary, they would record your choice and that choice would be public. And so that's, you know, after every presidential primary, we get umpteen requests for the participation report from that primary because it's where they get a, a sense of party affiliation. And so you'd be creating a second opportunity at that if you went this direction. Yeah. It would be available every two years in August. And I will say, I, uh, I probably, probably people know that I'm a Democrat, but I believe it was the National Democratic Party that was responsible for that. Senator Rahm. So I, I would say there's probably a lot of people who agree we're just extremely proud of our system and don't wanna require party registration. I will speak for myself. Um, I wonder if, there's been thought given to kind of behavioral nudges, like a user experience design of this and picking a color for each one and making it really clear somehow. I mean, I think if we wanted to limit confusion, we might have kind of a behavioral psychologist or user experience designer look at this and say, here are some options just to make sure that confusion is not as prominent for people. That's the only thing I can think of that would get at this issue without making a major change to how we run our, uh, how we do not require people to register by party. I have to admit, I did not understand a word you said. Right. I, 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 I have no idea how having red and blue and green and you request a red ballot as if that's still public knowledge everybody knows what a red ballot is. Audrey wants to say something. Maybe there's something other. Okay. Okay, well, Audrey. I am certainly not a legal expert on anything that has to do with what you have to notify in Vermont, but I, I do, I, I think Senator Rom brought up an interesting piece that there, there are some behavioral pieces um, that, that I know in my organization, uh, the Vote at Home Institute has worked with um, groups like Ideas 42 and the Center for Civic Design as to how are you communicating with voters to encourage them to, um, to sort of complete a ballot correctly. Um, and I actually, I keep an example here on my desk. This is, this is what my, my wife's ballot looks like here in Colorado. This is the one she didn't use in the primary. Um, and, and you can usually design aspects to these sorts of things can really be useful. And I know um, Chris and Will have, I think they've mentioned to me before that they've talked with the Center for Civic Design, but um, mm. Uh, we would be so pleased to to work with them, but also some of the other behavioral, like social science work that is that is behind all of this. So there are ways to do it um, that don't actually require law too. Oh, I, I I think that I completely misunderstood that. Stood that because 
we're not talking about the ballot, getting people to do the right ballot and send in the right ballot and return the other ballots. That's, that's a different issue. This is, are there alternatives to mailing out three ballots to begin with? Right. That, that's and, the question and, I think Will is asking us for, at this very moment. Okay, right. Sorry, I saw them as related because they all look exactly the same. Yeah. And I think and, that's a problem. That's basically what I'm trying to bring up. They look exactly the same. You have to just look really closely at the party and so that might confuse people. Yeah, no, I think, and I, I think that Will has already told us that he's working with um, some people on the design of the envelope and the design of the ballot and stuff. So that was this, what I wanted to get at here was, um, are there alternatives to sending them all out? Senator Clarkson. So uh, Will, how often is the primary ballot for any one of the parties longer than one page? Very rarely. So would it not be possible to print both sides of one so that you only have two pieces of paper rather than three? <laughs> Wouldn't that cut down costs? I Whose ballots are you gonna print back to back? So they could alternate year to year, like we alternate chairs for our joint committees. It could be very, very Democrat. It could be, you know, just rotated. It just like does not need to be a big deal. It, it strikes me that, you know, we have a front and a back that we are not using efficiently. And uh, the, anyway, that strikes me as one way to get rid of at least one ballot. I mean, piece of paper. Will? Carol? That's the first Silence. time I've heard oh that. <laughs> the first uh, time I've heard that suggestion. So uh, I, how would you how would you keep a voter from voting both sides of the ballot? Uh, just the same way we keep them from doing other things like signing their names on it. You might ask them to <laughs> to uh, you could mark it in a different color on the top. I mean, it it, it isn't difficult to. Uh, be pretty clear. And again, your instructions could be clear. And then it would be a spoiled ballot if they did. Ah, but then we're going to give them a chance nope. to cure. No, that isn't a curable. That's a spoiled right. ballot. Right. But I, I, no. I, I think, well, John. Just that I feel that would be far more confusing for people and would very much possibly dramatically increase the number of spoiled ballots. People are going to yeah. get a ballot. They're going to vote all over it three distinct ones, at least makes them stop and think for a minute. What makes them distinct if they're not color differentiated? It, they're three well, physically. different pieces of paper. I, I, I realize that, but to go to Keisha's point, you know. So I, I, I don't want us to talk about whether they look alike or how you distinguish. Right now you get three pieces of paper, three ballots. You can vote on one and return two in a, in a different way. Well, but you only can vote on one. If you had them back to back in many town um, elections or elections, you turn it over and then you keep voting. Why would that's why I to... asked that's why I prefaced it by asking Will how long the primary ballots usually are. I know. Okay. But I would just turn it over and keep voting. <laughs> no. Maybe not if it said something else on the top. <laughs> okay, does anybody else have an opinion about this? Senator Collimore? Just leave it the way it is, period. Thank you. Senator Polina? I agree with Senator Collimore. I mean, I, I understand it's an expense issue and I'm sympathetic to that, I really am. But I don't think we're gonna come up with a solution anytime soon. I think it's something to think about down the road because I, I think it is an expense that, is a lot of people feel is not quite worth it, but I think it's part of the process and I don't think we're gonna be able to fix it right now. Yes, I think you're right. And actually I think that a way of fixing it would be to have the parties run their own primaries because it is a party issue. The primary is not a state election issue. It's a, it's a party issue. And if each party ran their own elections, yeah, that would take care of it. So we, well, we used to do it that way. Lila. Oh, I'm sorry, what, what'd you say? We used to do it that way oh, right. in Vermont. We had caucuses. 
Lila had a, a question, Jeanette. Lila. Uh, yes, Lila Richardson with the League of Women Voters. Um, I think, Madam Chair, you said that you were going to address the issue of having to return all three ballots separately, but I just wanted to make sure it's true because I wasn't sure where it would fit on the agenda. It's one of the things that causes defective ballots and why the, my understanding is the primary rate of defective ballots was much higher because yeah. you have to return the two unvoted ballots and people were confused by that. So this would be related to that in my mind, that if you could only could request just one ballot, it would simplify that process. Yeah, it would. Well, but I think that we, it would simplify the process, but I think that we had that conversation that people do not want to be identified as requesting a ballot, a party but, ballot. No, I think I think that's part of the same issue. But yes, with, it would be we could exempt one other um, piece of the three ballot okay. process uh, is whether all three have to be returned, even if yes. all sent out. That that is a different question. Yes, and John, I saw your mm -hmm. hand up, and then Will. Yeah, I just. I was just going the same place. There's no reason, you know, we get a ballot, one one envelope, one ballot for the other elections and anonymity is, is held. Mm -hmm. um, so no reason why they would have to send back all three if they just sent back the one they voted on envelope, you have the same guarantee of anonymity and we don't know which one they voted on. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, I will I'll, um, call on you, but I saw that Audrey just held up her spouse's unused ballot so clearly in Colorado they don't mail back the unused ones well exactly I we noted the same thing I was going there too and I appreciate it from Lila though she's correct because the point I want to make was the discussion about whether your whether you could request just one ballot yes it's related to printing and giving us the ability to print fewer of the ones we know are requested less but it's also related to the uh, issue of defective rates in the primary and just trying to make that less difficult returning the unvoted ballots. And so another way you could address that is what Lila was suggesting, which is that the unvoteds don't come back. I'll just put it out there. I mean, the, um, the concern with that that I know will be raised is the existence of those live ballots, as we heard a lot talked about in November, it, which are, you know, unvoted official ballots being out there. Mm -hmm. But our standard refrain, and I think it's what John was getting at, is one voter, one ballot comes back. And it doesn't matter how many other blank ballots there are out in people's houses and on their kitchen tables. You only get to return one. And if you try and vote, let's say you return it and then tried to vote in person with the other one, you would have already been checked off the checklist. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, 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 you couldn't use that so that there isn't much power in an unvoted ballot if you used one already. Correct. So it strikes me they could recycle them and it would they, we'd, be done, we'd be done with it. So does it, uh, Senator Colomar? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm just trying to walk this through in my mind. So you mail out three, the, the voter fills one out and mails it back, keeps the other two. How are you saving any money? You aren't. You're not. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know what the advantage of that is. That was only, that was for the reducing the fact that a lot of the reason it's defective in the primary is they haven't returned those or they've returned them outside of the unvoted ballot envelope. And, that's, and, that's and the return envelope is cheaper. Why? Because it weighs less. I think that when you get into that size envelope, that that's, it's still painful, that's yeah. not a, a huge issue. But, but I think uh, that the, um, I mean, I, I would almost, because I think that there's going to be a lot of questions about those ballots hanging around out there. I would almost say, let's see what happens with a, a redesign of the ballots and the envelopes themselves and see in the next primary, if we have the same um, defective rate or if that goes down because we have a new design. And if it doesn't go down, then let's address it again. But if it goes down considerably because we've 
um, approached it in a better way, then there's no need to, because I, I do think you're right, Will, that that is gonna cause a lot of uh, concern by people who are concerned about um, election fraud. Yep. Anybody else? I thought I saw Carol's hand, but I'm not sure. All right, so we'll leave it the way it is for now. All right, I think that we, I will just, we'll take just a couple minutes of, uh, to look at this issue, but I think that we just simply do not have the time to be able to um, do this. And I think there's uh, more, con would cause more confusion was uh, the two uh, suggestions around rank choice voting. One was to let the parties, each party decide if they wanted to use rank choice voting in their primary. And um, I, if people wanna weigh in, I think it would be a little confusing if some parties did and some parties didn't but um, anybody want to weigh in on that suggestion? Uh, Paul? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Paul Burns, Executive Director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Uh, we did not um, uh, suggest this, this as a standalone question, the ranked choice voting um, in primaries, though it it kind of goes to the broader question of ranked choice voting, which uh, my organization and many others are supportive of. I, I recognize that I, and, and believe that this is not the time to certainly to uh, shoehorn this into another bill or uh, that you don't have the time probably right now to take this up. So I, while I wanna say, I think that this has merit as an idea and is worthy of consideration uh, by the committee at some point, um, uh, I recognize that this, this may not be the time. Um, uh, in broad strokes, though, we uh, have supported and continue to support the idea that this could be useful in state elections, particularly in federal elections. And when you use it there, you could look at the presidential primary or other, other primaries as well as the general election. I know at least five states used ranked choice voting for their presidential primary uh, elections in 2020. Um, I'm sure Audrey knows more about that, but, um, but you know, there's a Burlington question on the ballot in town meeting day, uh, that will be instructive and you may have a chance to consider this issue if, if that passes and you were to look at the um, request for a, a change to the charter there, for instance, and that might be the next reasonable opportunity to, to look at this issue from our perspective. So strongly supportive of the idea, but if this isn't the time, I don't, I don't feel the need to press it further now. So, uh, Anthony, uh, Senator Polina. I was just going to somewhat say similar to what Paul said. I, I, I believe frank choice voting is an important issue. It's important one that we take up. But I honestly think it'd be hard to take it up in, this, in the context of the way we're going through these ideas right now. I think it's deserving of its own hearing and a lot of input from the parties and whatnot. I think it's something that I, I'm supportive of in general, but I don't think we can give it the time that, and the attention that it really would take to do it now. Maybe we could do it later on in this. I'm not saying we should put it off for years, but I think we should put it yes. off for this for this discussion. Thank you. So unless anybody has any different thoughts on that, I'm going to just cross off that one and the first question under the general elections, which is to use ranked choice voting in the federal elections and just leave that whole discussion uh, for later. Is that okay? And unless anybody... Okay, thank you. Thank you. Because I think I think the committee has gotten bills on that anyway on our, on, in our committee. Correct. We may we may have one, yeah. And yeah. we do. Okay. So we can look at that later. All right. So this I know that the Secretary of State's office said they didn't know what the issue was here, but you were the ones that brought it to us, the issue of the presidential nominating process. It was on your list. So unless right. you, if you don't want to pursue it, I'm happy to drop it. I don't think we need to pursue it at this time, given what we're trying to do um, with everything else going on. Okay. Anybody really want to talk about that? Of anything, Senator White, just to put, drop the idea in your heads. It was 
I was thinking one one element of it was whether we may want to raise the filing fee for independent candidates. Oh, thank you, sweet. What is it? Hey. But, but honestly, we can move on. Okay, great. She just got hot tea. I did. I had uh, my tea angel deliver. Isn't that the best? Okay, so um, I'm going to skip to the skip over one here and go to the coordination of school and municipal and general elections and say that that is probably a conversation that needs to be held, but it is not going to be resolved in this bill. And it's um, more, I think we already talked about that. So can we cross it off unless anybody has really wants to talk about this? Senator Clarkson? I would just like to clarify what, what the problem is, because I know it's a problem, but I haven't experienced it so much. So I'd appreciate at least an articulation of, uh, and I know we're facing it now as we look at the Australian ballots in this COVID year. I know COVID has kind of exacerbated this problem. Um, could someone summarize the problem so that we know what we're putting off? Will, do you want to? Sure, really Could. quickly. That's, that's um, well put, Senator Clarkson, in that COVID certainly did elevate this issue. Um, and what the reason that it did is because of the authority you, that the legislature rightfully granted um, school boards to say they wanted to mail a ballot to all the voters in the school district. I think the best way for me to describe the fundamental issue here, it's, it's a little bit less about coordination between schools and towns than it is just um, defining the administration of elections in union school districts. Yeah. I think I've said to you guys before, there's no equivalent entity in those districts, for example, to a board of civil authority. They don't have election officials. So they rely traditionally on the town clerks. And under normal circumstances, they've been conducting their meetings in a certain way over time for a long time. For, for instance, they're using Australian ballot, but they do it by request. So when the town clerks get a request for their town ballot, they ask if the person also wants a school ballot, put them in the same envelope and send them out and it's not a big deal. It's a much bigger deal when you have, as is this year, school districts that have typically done their business from the floor or just on a request-based Australian ballot system, now saying, I would want to mail ballots to every voter in my district, and, and us saying, who are you asking to do that? Um, not, not my office, but just the ether, because there's no direction in the law who actually performs those duties. I mean, they, there's references to Australian ballot elections throughout the Union School District statutes without any language about how absentee ballots are administered. That's, that's crazy. Um, and so it leaves you at a point saying who's responsible for these duties, um, whether they're lined up with the town elections or not. And that's and why that we put is in a bigger project for me and the agency of education to work on and bring proposals to you guys about. Yes, and just a minute, Carol, and that's why we put the thing in the um, ability for the municipalities to um, mail out their ballots this year we put in language in there encouraging cooperation um, between the towns and the schools. Carol? It, it would be a big enough problem if it was a one-on-one -on -one issue, one school district, one municipality, but it's exacerbated by the fact that we now have so many merged school districts. And so, you know, five, six, seven different school districts are, our towns are part of one school district and trying to coordinate all those different ballots. So. John? And some that have multiple school districts, you know, their elementary, their high school, all overlapping, yeah. sorry. Yeah, John. I would just say, you know, you've got cases now where it's not working. You've got cases now where it is working. And the cases where it is working is when there's uh, unanimity, there's agreement between all the towns in the school district and then the individual towns and municipalities within it. So they allowed to coordinate it. I don't see why you couldn't just uh, put in even just a line into the bills allowing authorizing school districts to do this too, if member towns all also choose to mail out their own municipal ballots as well. I mean, just toss a line like that in there and then you can, you would allow a town like Montpelier 
uh, to, to keep doing what we're doing that's gonna work fine now, as long as Roxbury, the other town in, in our school district went along with it too. It would give Roxbury veto power over the whole process, but then it would also allow us all to have a consensus if we wanted to do it, if you just linked those two things together. And I think you could do that in a sentence. Uh, Will? To clarify, and that John and I spoke about this a little bit. He, John's referring back to the provision that we already talked about, about um, allowing municipalities to mail out ballots. And over the mm -hmm. course of that discussion, I pointed out that I thought it would make more sense to only allow that for towns and cities and not school districts because of this gaping hole in the administration of school district elections. And what John's saying, which I think we could at least consider and I could try working on with him, I don't know if it's as simple as he thinks it is, but it may be um, to say that a school district could also vote to mail out all of their ballots. It should be their decision. You shouldn't be having towns on an individual basis making decisions about what they do with the school district ballots. Um, if the school district were to decide to do that, they could, they could and they could only do so if they had the agreement of the towns within their district is I believe what John's suggesting. So it'd be school board checks in with two select boards those select boards say, yes, we want to send out the school ballot with our town ballots. We're doing that with our town ballots this year. So yeah, we're gonna move forward. Um, I, I yeah. jumped a little on that, I apologize. I just don't, the idea of putting all those eggs into that basket unnecessarily that, you know, the concerns, the structural concerns that Will is talking about, I think is not, uh, you know, is not necessary and could even step us back a little bit. Well, if you can come up with some language, uh, I, it won't certainly won't do anything for this year because this isn't no. even going to be passed no, no. until well after that. And and I think that there are so many other issues around. I mean, there's still the issue of who administers the school elections. And, and um, we now have, um, when we had BUHS district, I guess they did it. Um, we now have a separate elementary school district that has seven towns in it and um, the town clerks, I, I think that that has to be worked out. So um, if, if you can come up with some simple language here, um, that would be great, but I think that this is a larger question. So, okay. Great. So now the next one on our list, is to declare election day a holiday. And does anybody want to weigh in on this? I can, I'm going to start this. I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but so we, when um, we've had this discussion a number of times, and first of all, I'm not sure if we're talking about general election day, uh, primary election day, or town meeting election day. And when I was on the select board in Putney, we thought maybe if we had the, our, um, uh, it shouldn't be a holiday. Well, if you have a, a holiday, only state employees get the day off anyway. Nobody else gets that holiday. Just because it's a holiday doesn't mean people get it off. So we had our town meeting on a Saturday because more people could come, right? They weren't working. And the res we had far fewer people there. And the response was, I'll give up a weekday, but I'm not gonna give up a, a Saturday. And if you have a holiday, if it's a holiday, I'm gonna go skiing. I'm not. <laughs> so weigh in here what you think committee members and others. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with you. I don't think it would necessarily make uh, it any more likely that a voter would, would turn out to vote than it does now. So I would oppose this. And only state employee, if we declared it a state True. holiday, only state employees would get the day off if they no. bargained for it. And nobody else, the place that I, that most, place, most places private um, give between five and seven or eight maybe ho paid holidays a year, but 
I doubt that they'd give election day as one. So anybody else care to weigh in? Senator Polina? I can't, I hate to come out against the holiday. It seems like so uh, counterintuitive, but I, I think you're right in terms of, I don't think it would necessarily increase uh, attendance or, or participation, but I, I think the idea of a holiday is always kind of nice, but I think, you know, you make a good point that it's not going to make a difference. So I guess I, I, I'd say I'm leaning in your direction. I would be glad to put a bill in to calling it Polina Day if, you, if you're just <laughs> interested in having a holiday. That's good. And I'll Thank you. Is Senator Clarkson, you're muted. You're muted, Senator Clarkson. <laughs> We had that <laughs> we had that holiday and we changed the name of it. Um, the <laughs> thank you for those of you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I would agree. We have data uh, because we have it both as a holiday and not as a holiday. Many of our towns change it to Saturday to try and get more attendance. I think we have a lot of internal work in our towns to boost attendance. There are some, and I don't think it's related to whether or not it's a holiday. Um, I, 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 the pleasure of going to Heartland every year is that it's on a Tuesday and it is packed. It's packed. Uh, and then you go to the next town and there are, you know, a hundred people. It, it, it is, a, I think an internal marketing challenge for each town. And I think that, uh, sadly, I wish making it a holiday would affect attendance, but I don't think it would. Senator Polina. Also, if we're thinking about it for the general election, the statewide general elections, mail-in voting seems to have boosted participation quite a bit. So maybe exactly. we're making progress there. Right. It, that was a much more effective way of, of engaging voters and having them participate. So I, I Senator Rahm. So I, as usual, I, this might be a slight tangent, but I think what has come up, um, and especially this year is, there, we have only people who are generally retired who can participate in the, the administration of our elections. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who want to be able to volunteer, whether it's for part of the day, for a candidate, for some part of Tuesday, they want to participate and they feel penalized by their workplace. And I don't know that there's a law that we can pass, but you know maybe there's something in the Secretary of State's office where they they give like a gold star to businesses that let their employees go volunteer on election day, you know, some kind of compact to create more civic participation. That's my thought for the day on this. Yeah, that's a, something like that is a good idea, but if it was a holiday, they wouldn't necessarily get it off, especially if they worked in private business. Sorry, you're, you're I mean, I, yeah, I would just completely agree that holidays don't usually help working people. Yeah. That's where I am with that. But, you know, maybe we can increase civic participation for those who really want to participate in Tuesday as an important day in the country. And there that's are, a great idea. There are companies that um, give their, like Brattleboro Savings and Loan Bank down here, gives their all their employees a certain number of hours per month to participate in uh, community activities. So something like that. So I will say... Uh, Allison, to your, Senator Clarkson, to your point about internal marketing to get people at town meeting. According to Frank Bryan, to have real participation, you have to have a real issue. You have to have the discussion and you have to have a vote. And the biggest problem that we have with town meeting is that we don't allow them to have real issues. We tell them what they can do and what they can't do. There's my little speech for the day. And, and Senator White, I uh, respectfully disagree. I think that the, the pleasure of a community gathering in the towns that have robust attendance, uh, it, it doesn't matter that the, the discussion is always rich. And uh, the, it, it, yes, I think it often helps having a big issue, but that also skews it sometimes and has people just coming for one thing and then leaving. Uh, I, you know, I think that the, Building community around town meeting is a challenge for every town, and I wish more towns would take it on as an opportunity. Yeah, I didn't mean to say we should have they should have one big issue. 
every we we should give them the ability to make decisions on their own, which we don't do at the state level. We dictate everything that they can do almost. And so if town meeting in fact is reduced to a cute um, article in the Boston Globe about people having bean suppers together and sitting at town meeting knitting, then we've lost town meeting. So that's, that's my yeah. speech. And I've been at town meetings where they have uh, defunded the sheriff's office, where they have voted to reverse financing okay. for sidewalks, where they have stripped uh, the police department of tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, I, I think there are, are some decisions that are actually made at town meetings still. There are. I'm, and I'm sorry I brought it up. It's just I have to take every <laughs> opportunity to to say that we need to give our towns more ability for self-governance. That's all and, I'm saying. And I'm happy to pass our bill again. We will take it's it up next bill. week. So the next one on our list is review the major party requirements. Do we want to take that on? I don't know right now. It's that they're, they have to be organized in 30 um, towns in at least seven counties and get at least 5% of a, in a statewide um, office, a 5% of the vote. Is, is there, are there problems with that? I don't remember where this came from. Anybody? Maybe the party people here could actually speak to it. Well, we only have major party people here. So is that is it a problem for the major parties? Bruce, you're not nodding your head or just he's well, Bruce Olson, Vermont Democratic Party. I would say this is not a priority for the, our party. Okay. Martha. Thank you. Martha Abbott, assistant treasurer of the Vermont Progressive Party. Um, I think this discussion usually takes place in the context of other possible changes to the primary election process. Um, it's been the requirement for a while and then that's fine. You know, I don't think we have a problem with it. It becomes a problem sometimes when we try to interact it with other possible changes um, to the election law. So okay. Such as the, there was a recent discussion about if, if you're in enter one primary as opposed to another primary and then you get a write in and so you're a, the nominee of two parties. How does that work? And there's some interaction in those issues. But by itself, I don't think we have a problem with it. Okay. So unless anybody else has something they'd like to throw in on this or concerns about it, I think we'll cross this one off the list. And then what I'm going to suggest is that we take a, a few minute break here. But before we go, just picking up on what Martha was talking about that when we um, have Amarin, um, we had last, in our last meeting, we talked about two issues related to the parties. One was where the 5% gets assigned, which party it gets assigned to. And the other one was the um, the positioning of your party's initials on the ballot, and I um, I voted with uh, two other people around the um, three other people around the five percent. Um, I'm going to change that vote of mine because I think it doesn't matter. And I'm also going to change my vote on the placement of the RDPLU, whatever, whatever party you want to put behind your name. Because I think that those are party questions and not necessarily general. I know that they're in the, in the statutes, but I think they're more party issues. So uh, I'm going, we can have a little discussion on that, but I'm going to suggest that we not address those issues in this bill. Committee? Uh, Senator Collimore? 
Senator Polina. Did Senator Collimore say anything? He put his thumbs up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, he's not on my screen. I couldn't tell. You're probably not surprised that I would tend to agree with you. So I would put a thumbs up as well. Senator Clarkson. But we were saving this for after our break when I'll be refreshed. No. But uh, <laughs> oh. um, I, I'm disappointed. I, I think it's a, a, an issue we need to resolve. I think I wish you'd send us all to the cafeteria and work on resolving it because I think there are issues that we should be resolving. I mean, I there it, it's uh, uh, so I I understand where you're coming from. I am and um, I appreciate that. I'm just disappointed that we uh, are not going to have uh, address this in this bill. Senator Rahm. So I mean, being new, I'm just sort of thinking, okay, that you know. Were, we were asking party folks to come share issues that they had about general election issues is, is what you would want to focus on. So we're still inviting party people to the table, um, but it's you want it all to be focused on general election. I mean, being new to the committee, I, I'm certainly not going to contradict that. I just think particularly the issue about major party status felt like an, an inter-party issue where one party in and of themselves can't really make any determinations for themselves. I didn't understand that. We, I, I'm, yeah. we had the, two, the two issues, I feel like, you know, I, I guess you, what you're saying is even though there was an issue that we were discussing that could be between two parties, like a minor party and a major party or two major parties, you want them to work it out themselves, but the issue still lives with the Secretary of State's office. They're still the one that says right now, oh, you can just pick whichever party you want to give your percentage to, et cetera. That just feels hard for one party to be able to determine on their own. Well, the, no, I'm not saying that the, that it, it's, it's in statute. Right. So, so I'm not saying that the Secretary of State would do it. I'm saying that I don't think that this is the appropriate bill to deal with this issue. And I think that it well, could end up being the poison pill well, I, I think that's the issue. Is is it the poison pill? Oh. Uh, I I think it's it's an issue that in I'd love to resolve. I mean, I'm happy to have a conversation about it between the parties, but it is an issue where the voters vote one way, thinking they're electing a candidate who is represents X values, and then the candidate changes themselves and decides to run as a Y valued person. I think it's a misrepresentation of that candidate. And that is, a, I think, a core election issue. I understand that it's a poison pill because we disagree and it would be, uh, it, 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 I understand that. But I, I also, I, I would hope we could be encouraged to have that conversation elsewhere. And I, I would love to know what that forum is because I think that it needs to be resolved. I'm happy, I, 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 I appreciate you're not wanting to make this elections bill a poison pill, you know, put embedding something in it that is divisive. I get that. Um, but it is an issue that somewhere in some form we need to address. And I, I think that it does need to be addressed, but I'm not sure that even statutorily is how it gets addressed. I, I think that, um, and the more I think about it, if, if I run in one party's primary as something, and then change my mind in the general election and um, take the party that uh, wrote me in, then, um, and I, then the voters are, are somewhat, they were hoodwinked. They feel like they were hoodwinked that time. So if the same person does the same thing the next time, then I say that um, if you're, if you fool me once, shame on, you, but if you fool me twice, shame on me. So if the vote, if that same thing happens in the next election with the same person and the voters still fall for it, then that's the voters choice. So I, I just, I think it is an issue and it's an issue in some places as opposed to other places and with some people as opposed mm -hmm. to other people. But I think it is not a general enough issue that we should put it in this bill. So, 
I will just yeah. say, first of all, I really, you know, I usually I'm used to in the past sort of being taken aside by the chair and told this just isn't <laughs> going to fly. So I appreciate your transparency. So I want to just honor that. Um, you know, I, I, I personally, I was the only one who had a different vote on um, major party status versus who gets to decide where to put their um, name of the party, what order, mm -hmm. because I do feel like it has a really big outcome in our elections to be able to just decide where you put the percentage of your vote and, and determine major party status. That did feel like something that is, you know, has material uh, consequences that aren't remedied in a future election. So I can get over that, but I did feel like it was a general election issue. But I'm just saying I value your transparency. I'm just making that final point known. And I'll, I'm happy to go with the you're the chair chairwoman. Anybody else? All right. So Amara, and I just wanted to make sure that you were and and I and I also do believe in transparency. I think I was wrong. And I'm perfectly happy to admit that I, I think I made the wrong choice um, on those issues, given where we are with this bill and the importance of, of getting something major done. So anybody else have anything to say about Senator Collimore? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to just not say anything more about it, but I think you bring up a, an interesting point. Um, and I think it's up to the candidate. Uh, in many ways, if the candidate is willing to risk political suicide, in essence, by doing exactly what you said, I don't think they would get elected the second time. I think people would say, we don't know who this person is, because uh, they flip flop so often. I'm not voting for that person. So I think it is sort of a decision that the, the candidate could make and, and uh, commit political suicide. Senator Polina. So just um, coming off of that, it's basically, it's up to the voters to make those decisions. And I think that's what we're saying is that the voters will decide ultimately. Yep. I, also do, I also do appreciate your honesty, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. We always appreciate it. It's one of the things we treasure about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna suggest we take, I don't know what time it is, because I can three o'clock exactly. How about if we take a 10 minute break, come back and get into uh, the issue of mail out ballots? Sure. And I, the other thing I'm going to suggest is that we take that we not look at campaign finance and public financing of elections in this bill, that we do that in a separate bill. Sure. So I've just crossed those off the list. So we'll come back and talk about mail out voting as opposed okay. to mail-in voting. Thank you.